bandwidth for changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. I'm Zeno Rocha and you're listening to The Changelog. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stukoviak. This is episode 248, and today on the show, we're talking to Zeno Rocha, Principal Developer Advocate at LifeRay. We're talking about DevRel, his open source work, his passion for teaching and giving talks at conferences. He also shares some really interesting stories about his first contributions to open source, how that played out, and the lessons he learned along the way. Our sponsors for the show today are Sentry, TopTal, Datadog, and GoCD. First sponsor of the show today is our friends at Sentry, helping you to find and fix your errors in your applications. You can start tracking your errors today totally free. They support React, Angular, Ember, Vue, Backbone, and Node frameworks like Express and Koa. You can view actual code and stack traces, including support for source maps. See the errors URL, parameters, and session information, and even prompt your user for feedback when you have front end errors. Head to changelaw.com slash sentry. Start tracking your errors today for free. No credit card required. Get off the ground with their free plan. And when you're ready to expand your usage, simply pay as you go. Once again, changelaw.com slash sentry. And now onto the show. All right, we're back today. Got Zena Rocha joining us today. Principal developer advocate at LifeRay. And, you know, Zeno, I learned about you because I was trying to reach out to folks in that space. I was working with Sandra Pershing at Mozilla about something she's, she's got going on DevRel Summit. And Justin Dorfman said, you need to talk to Zeno. And so, <laughs> so here you are. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> welcome, Adam. <laughs> welcome, everybody. And so first off, the coolest name ever, Zeno <laughs> Rocha. I mean, you must get applause just when you say your name in front of the stage or something like that. It's crazy. Like when I'm on a phone, nobody, like I, I say my name, nobody understands it. It's not that good. <laughs> now what's the, I'm an American, so I've got just a typical English way I say it. What's mm-hmm. the, the enunciated way to say it in uh, like your native tongue? Yeah. So I'm from Brazil and uh, usually people just call me Zeno, okay. uh, but Zeno is fine. Z, whatever you want to call me. Yeah. If it starts with Z, I will. I will answer. You'll answer. Okay. What about what about Rocha then? Yeah, Rocha is fine. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. So there's no there's no uh, rolling of the R, no trill there. No, no. <laughs> okay. All right. I thought there might have been. So I was. I'm now I'm slightly disappointed. <laughs> um, but you got a fun history in open source, though. So you you know, developer advocates. I mean, what a what a role that's. I wouldn't say underappreciated, but under understood, right? Yeah. There's so much work inside of a company because as companies like LifeRay and others continue to grow and start to adopt more and more technology, so to speak, right? They become, you know, not simply just businesses. Now they actually have software development departments that create proprietary software and then also open source some of that stuff. Like you've got to have somebody inside the company that knows both sides of the spectrum. Is that roughly crack at what a developer advocate is to a company like LifeRay? Yeah, yeah. I think there are there are, I think this is a, a new position, right, in the market. Uh, this is something uh that when I started didn't exist and or if it existed, I didn't know about it. Uh and it was like a, a natural progression, at least for me. But I think the like nowadays we have uh it's basically like two kinds of companies that you have. Like we have companies that their the audience, their target market are developers. So in that case, the way that marketing is done is completely different and they need to adapt to that certain world. Or you have companies that their end product is not only for developers. So let's say Facebook, it's not a company that their target audience are developers, but they, they do reach out to developers and they have like this open source department because they know how important it is to reach out to developers and when they build their SDKs and those kinds of things. 
So I think that's how it, it always started. I think, um, this is like a, a new position out there and it's starting to, to grow more and more. How new is this position? Like, I think the first time I heard the title was maybe two ish years back. You know, there's always been some sort of advocacy, but I think the first time I'd actually heard the, the actual title was maybe about two, maybe three years back. Is, mm-hmm. that, is that about when you think you may have surfaced the word as well, itself? Yeah, I'm not sure like 100% about what is, uh, how it started. Uh, but I think the first guy that had this title uh, was a guy called Guy Kawasaki. Right, So he, at Apple. He, yes, exactly. So I think he, he was the one who started. And I think it was like developer evangelist or chief developer evangelist, chief evangelist, something like that. And it's basically like um, a position. It's different. And, and, and for a lot of time, there were like job titles that were related to that, like community manager, you know, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, They're on the same ballpark, basically. Exactly, exactly. So developer evangelist, developer advocates, community manager, they are all like kind of related, but they they have their differences, you know, like some people don't like uh, the name community manager because uh, a community and we we can talk about any kind of community, it shouldn't be managed by someone, right? So uh, I think this is this is a title that people are trying to not use that much anymore. Uh, they're going more towards advocate because it's like a group of people, like fa- facilitators to the community. It's not like they 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 manage the community. Yeah, and you know, I didn't get that memo. I didn't know that mm-hmm. uh, that community manager wasn't cool anymore i guess that it was yeah. found upon, so to speak <laughs> yeah yeah Th- this is something that it, it's like a trend uh in the past years like some people starting to to discuss more because now like uh now we're having conferences about developer relations we, we so there's there's going to be one in san francisco this the the devrel summits that you just mentioned in seattle and you have conferences in tokyo about that so I think this is like a field that is growing more and more, and it's interesting to see. So have you been to one of these conferences yet? No, I have no idea how they are, but I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious too, because, you know, as I mentioned, how I came to know you better was through mm-hmm. a friend of the show, Justin Dorfman. Thanks, Justin. I was talking to him, and he's played that kind of role at Max CDN, which is now StackPath, and now he's at Sticker Mule. Um, big fan of the change loggers in the community also running sustain, uh, an upcoming conference. So if you haven't checked that out, go to sustain OSS.org. We're a part of that as well. So if, if you're in that space at all about sustaining open source or advocating, I mean, that, that, so long story short, that's how I met you was through Justin and sort of peering mm-hmm. into this world of DevRel and kind mm-hmm. of. You know, we, we like to travel to conferences with our podcast called Spotlight. So if you're listening to this and you haven't heard of Spotlight yet, go to changelaw.com slash spotlight. Lots of good episodes there that Jared and I have done when traveling to OzCon, All Things Open, uh, Node Interactive, and potentially, you know, some other conferences this year. But we like to go there and kind of pull back that hallway track that you don't often get a chance to record and take away and share that with the rest of the world. So we we sort of have the hallway track conversations you would want to have or have heard, you know, if you were a fly on the wall, so to speak. And mm-hmm. so we were really interested in doing DevRel Summit with, uh, with Sandra and, and making that happen. And so when I started to reach into this world a bit more and figure out, you know, how we can make it happen, you know, one of the people that came up was talking to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I don't think we gave you a full on true introduction, though. And I don't want to go too far into the show before we have a chance to do that. So for mm-hmm. those who don't know, I know you told us how to say your name and all that fun stuff, but that's a fun name, <laughs> but give us a snapshot of who you are. Kind of give us a bit of your history, either in this position you're in now, in this role you're in now, or open source at large, you, you know, your story best. Help me mm-hmm. share who you are. Yeah, sure. Like, uh, I'm a front end developer, uh, by heart. That's what I love doing. That's uh, what I like doing. And, uh, I started, uh, with flash as, uh, lots of people, you know, I remember I was like working on this design agency, uh, and it was great. You know, uh, at that time I loved to, to use flash. It was great. Uh, 
when compared to other languages, I didn't have the same satisfaction uh, as I had with Flash. Uh, I would like spend hours, like with some languages that I, I was trying in the beginning, you know, I was still in university and uh, I would have to like work for hours and then compile. And then when I see something on my screen, it's like that black box with some, some message, you know. Uh, and with Flash, I would like work for 15 minutes, compile, and then I would see everything <laughs> like spinning around and <laughs> doing all those kinds of things. Uh, so for me as a visual human being, that was very appealing. Uh, and then uh, at that time, I was uh, like HTML5 just came out. There was a lot of people talking about it, uh, but there's one guy in particular, Paul Irish. And I was very inspired by that guy. I remember like just watching what he was doing and I was like, oh my gosh, uh, one day I want to be like that guy in Brazil or, or something, you know, like basically like I was very uh, interested in like HTML5 boilerplate and some other projects. Uh, there was like a ebook or just like an online uh, book called uh, Dive into HTML5. I started translating that book. Uh, so it was a very interesting moment. Uh, and I started to do more experiments with HTML5. My first one, and I'm going to send you this. Uh, you can check it out and then you guys can see on the, on the comments. So I made this as my first HTML5 experiment. And let me just send you. And the idea was just like playing around with Canvas, right? Uh, there was like lots of exciting technologies on in HTML5, and this was one of it. Um, wow! Like, yeah, like playing with Canvas and uh, just uh, like there was local storage. I was playing with that. I was playing with everything that I I could see about HTML5, uh, but this one was very appealing to me, and I was just interested about it. So. I was getting involved, looking at all this, and um, my father, he always said to me, like, oh, if you really want to learn something, you need to teach it, right? So this is a very common phrase, like, if you really want to learn, teach it. If you really want to learn, teach it. Uh, and I would hear that, and I would, like, go to the, these conferences, and I was like, okay. Uh, so I think, uh, I'm, I'm interested in learning HTML5 at that time. I didn't know HTML5 at all, but I went, I was interested about it and I saw this conference and, uh, they had like a open call for papers. So I was like, okay, I'm going to submit a talk about HTML5 and they had like this huge, uh, field so I could fill my, my work experience and I didn't have <laughs> any work experience. I was like at the university. Uh, I was working with Flash, but I wanted to learn HTML5. So I submitted a talk about HTML5. I didn't expect them to accept the talk, but they did. Wow. <laughs> and it was insane. Like, I was super worried. I was like, oh my gosh, what I did. Uh, I thought about giving up. I was like, I, I, why, why did I, I, I did this? You know, there's no reason I should have, like, there's no point in doing this. But then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this talk. So it was super nice because I, I got to learn HTML5 and just understand a little bit more. Uh, I didn't know everything about it, but I wanted to learn more. And that really changed me. Like my first talk completely changed the way I looked uh, to the world, you know, like the way I would view my work, my job, everything that I was doing. Uh, from one point, I was like, okay, I was working as a freelance, getting as much jobs as I could, trying to make as much money as I could. And when I gave that talk, everything like transformed, you know, and I was getting into open source at the same time. So everything like really transformed uh, in my life. And I was like, uh, okay, now I see a meaning. It's not only about me. It's not only about me making money doing those kind of work, you know, because at, at least for me, um, opening the code editor, I don't know if you felt that way before, if you did freelance before, but like just opening the code editor, I would like feel the pain, you know, like, oh my gosh, I need to work in this project. I don't want to work this anymore. Uh, 
uh, and I need to do X, Y, and Z in this project. So that's how it all started. I started to give talks and I started to get into open source. Yeah. What, what, how far back was this, this first talk you gave? I think, uh, so at least one, this moment in time. Yeah, this was in 2011. So I was still in the university and I was doing, uh, just, uh, starting to work my first job. And, uh, that's when I submitted the stock, they accepted and I gave it. And then it was like one after the other. Uh, I really Where loved was the talk at. The talk was in Brazil, uh, in a city near Rio. Uh, it was like an open source kind of conference. Like the, there was a lot of talks about Linux or Ubuntu or uh, like PHP, other like open source technologies. Front end was really like, uh, it's not like it is today that uh, front end is super big and many people just interested on that front end was starting like there was no front end tracks in a, right. in a big conference you know but yeah they accepted and and i gave the talk and i guess to to bring some context to to where we're trying to get to is like your first mm -hmm. step into open source was sort of rocky uh, we had a mm -hmm. call about a month or so ago you and i to kind of kick some conversations off basically about having you on the show and you pointed me to this, uh, this project you started called J jQuery Boilerplate. And yes. it was to issue number 10 on the issues on their project. We'll link it up in the show notes. So if you're listening to this, check the show notes. But the title of this issue was sort of off-putting. <laughs> I mean, I say sort of, sort of tongue-in-cheek because it was totally not cool, right? This is <laughs> it's just not the kind of issue you want to see come through your email inbox, right? And yeah. the title of this issue is Everything is Wrong, So Deleted All of It. This way you can start over and do it right. So yeah, frame that for us. Like, it, was this your very first project? You know, what was the scenario here? And like, how did this issue in particular impact you? Yeah. So I was really like influenced by, by the success of HTML5 boilerplate. And I was loving jQuery. And I, at that time, I didn't have, I didn't build a single uh, jQuery plugin. but I, I was interested on it and uh, some one day at work, I was like, mm, maybe this piece of code that I'm writing, maybe I could make this as a open source project and as a jQuery plugin. So I was looking around, seeing all the options that there were out there, lots of different patterns for building jQuery plugins. And there was no like, okay, this, this is the, the way you should go. You know, one single pattern, at least for, for someone that is just starting, like this is how you should do it. Uh, so I was like, mm, I should build one. But the problem is I haven't built anything before with that, but I, I was like, I was going to give it a try. So I built this repository, my first repository on GitHub, I guess. And then uh, I built this pretty website uh, and I launched it. So I launched that and uh, in the first day there were like 10 access like nobody really saw it just my friends and things like that on the second day i sent a tweet to smashing magazine uh that was in 2011 and then they shared the tweet i like i was super surprised you know i was like nobody's gonna see this nobody's gonna like this but i'm gonna give a try i sent the tweet and they they shared the project so on the second day there was like 2000 uh, people visiting and then like Suddenly this project was like, boom, you know, everybody was singing it. And then, um, of course I was like, <laughs> not a, I was not an expert. I'm still not an expert, but, uh, I got this, this pull request, everything is wrong. So delete all of it this way you can start over and do it right. <laughs> so it was very like harsh, uh, very difficult. And I was like, yeah, th that's the end. Why again, you know? Same question. Uh, I asked myself why I did this. There was no way, no reason for me to do this. I should have just like stayed home wow. doing doing other things. <laughs> you were an imposter, man. Yeah. You don't belong yeah. here. You know, digging yeah. into this a little further too, like the the. Yeah. So when you fork a repository, you can you know do the work in your own in your own branch, right? And so the the branch that this was done in, the branch name was called Reset This Crap. <laughs> 
I don't know if you've noticed that, like, because you, you know, this I is your story, it. not mine, but like, yeah, it's even it goes even further. Like the the branch they put there, this reset in was reset dash this dash crap. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Uh, but the 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 interesting part of this pull request is that uh, I accept it. You know, it, it shows this close, but I, I I merged the the commit, and I was willing to to do it over again. So I remember reaching out to Adios Money. He was working in uh, AOL in the UK, and then I was like, Hey, I know you're very good at. The things you do, you know, he was uh, doing some really good things with JavaScript. And I just reached out to him. I sent an email to him and asked for help. And he helped me. And uh, we kind of like we redid that. And then uh, it's still like a very popular project. Even though jQuery, uh, like not many people are using as before. But uh, like since 2011, people have been using this and kind of worked. <laughs> That's crazy. So jQueryBulletPlate.com is the website mm-hmm. that I was talking about. And uh, you got the bullet plate there, you got patterns, you got generator, you got guides. And it, as you said, even though jQuery is sort of frowned upon now that they prefer to do it different ways or it's just not cool anymore, there's, there's, mm-hmm. the web has moved on, moved on. Most people can actually pinpoint their start into web or JavaScript because of jQuery. And mm-hmm. anybody who would consider them primarily an HTML CSS developer got into JavaScript because of the ease and the connecting points of like mapping DOM elements, you know, the HTML classes to CSS classes, then to jQuery JavaScript classes. Like, so mm-hmm. it, it, it's got its point there, but wow. So you reached out to, to Addy and Addy mm-hmm. Asmani, uh pre Google. So this yes. is, this is a while back. Most people know him from working at Google. And all the work he's done there and uh, other work you've done with him since then. But like, what was that like reaching out to somebody you didn't even know? Did you even know him? I didn't know him. And I was very like, uh, my, my thoughts and uh, my, my mindset is always, I'm going to try to do this. Uh, if it works, great. If it doesn't, then that's fine, you know? So that's why I reached out to him. And, uh, I, and when I see those people, you know, they are all like very busy people, you know, like those guys that you see on Twitter all the time uh, doing some like crazy project. You know, they're always very busy uh, and you always imagine that they will not have time for you. And that's most of the cases. That's true. You know, uh, life is all about uh, like time, you know. So when you give your time to someone else, like like why I'm here today talking to you, you know. I could be doing something else. I could be watching Netflix. I could be doing uh, whatever, uh, anything different from that. Work. But uh, yeah, work. <laughs> More open <exactly>. source. <laughs> yeah, another project. Yeah. Why not? Gotcha. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, those people, they are also willing to help. And so I think it's it, it was a good move. Uh, I'm glad he replied. I also like think that if you are listening and if you have someone that you really admire and you follow, his or her work, uh, why not reach out? You know, those people, they do a lot of work on their free time. They spend weekends doing those things. So sometimes just like one phrase uh, could like change their day. So, oh, man. yeah, we get emails yeah. every once in a while. They don't, they don't happen too often, but often enough that when we get them, they're nice boosts of confidence back into like, okay, what we're doing is actually impacting people. Okay, what we're doing is is really being appreciated by the people listening because other than people going to changelaw.com slash community and signing up and hopping in Slack and hanging out with us behind the scenes, other than, like, you're part of that too, other than people doing that, like, we really haven't had this personal touch to the audience who's listened to the show since 2009, which is when this show started. So we've been on air for the better part of seven-ish years, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. this is even more than that, isn't it? My, That's great. My, my math is incorrect. It's like eight-ish, right? That's awesome. That's I mean, awesome. it's been a while. So, yeah, getting that kind of feedback is is awesome. But something I don't want to gloss over is is you said that you accepted the pull request. Yeah. Now, I don't want to camp out there too much if it's not worth it, but I feel like if you accept the pull request that deletes all of your code, that's that's sort of like bold to do as the person submitting the PR. 
but then humble on the other side to actually take it and 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 say okay you're right or whatever mm-hmm. and actually accept the pull request that deletes all of your code and start again like that's yeah. that's crazy yeah i think you you need to think about like all the other people out there you know uh, this guy that opened the pull request he was much more experienced than me and there was no reason in being just like okay i'm not going to do anything about it or i could delete the repo you know uh, ultimately, I wanted to help, and uh, how can I better help other people? That's why that was I the did whole point of the repo in the first place was this bullet plate that would hopefully give someone else some bootstraps to stand up upon when doing mm-hmm. anything new with jQuery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, have you ever had a, a run in with the person who opened the pull request? I keep saying the person because I don't want to say their name yeah. unless you want to, because I'm not going to do that. But you could, no, we're going to link to the issue so you can do the research on your own. But we're not trying to flame yeah. anybody. We're just sort of having a no, conversation no. around this moment in your time and how it's impacted your life and your story. Yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, I, ha- I didn't uh, have the, the opportunity yet, but it, there's no like... There's no time limit. The, yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> the invitation to some degree is still open, basically. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, you've done some other stuff, so we're, gonna, we're, we're getting yes. close to time for a break. One thing that we use that's probably a very small project, but a cool project for you is clipboard.js. We use that on changelog.com. So if you go to any episode and you click the share button and you get that, there's an overlay that comes up. You get a chance to copy any of the URLs to like the URL to link to it. So that's one thing. And then also the embed code to embed our episodes into your blog and our medium posts or websites or whatever. So we have that option. So we use clipboard.js for that. You got Dracula theme. Uh, mm-hmm. We talked about jQuery Bullet Put with one of your first earlier projects, Browser Diet, and a ton of other stuff. You've been involved in web components. So I just kind of want to tee some of that stuff up before we go into this break to sort of like let the audience marinate on some things we may talk about. So awesome. we'll, uh, we'll take this break. When we come back, we'll dive a little further into your story and some of that stuff. So we'll be right back. If you're looking for trusted freelance talent, ready to join your team right now, I mean like within the week, call upon my friends at TopTal, T-O-P-T-A-L.com. And as a listener of the show, you might actually be one of those developers or designers looking for awesome freelance, independent contractor type opportunities where you can still be a remote worker. You can still have the freedom you have right now, which means you can travel anywhere, you can be anywhere and do what you do. That's also an opportunity. We love Top Top. They've been supporting this show for a very long time. They're really good friends of ours. If you want a personal introduction, I'd be glad to give that to you. Email me, adam at changelaw.com. Otherwise, head to toptal.com. That's T-O-P-T-A-L.com to learn more. Tell them Adam from Changelog sent you. Our next sponsor is our friends at Datadog. Your application sits on layers of dynamic infrastructure and supporting services. And they want to help you bring visibility into every part of your infrastructure. Plus, they have APM for monitoring your application's performance. They got dashboarding, collaboration tools, alerts that let you develop your own workflow for observability and incident response. Datadog integrates seamlessly with all of your apps and systems from Slack to Amazon Web Services so you can get visibility in minutes. Head to changelaw.com slash Datadog to get started. Get a free t-shirt when you sign up and integrate for the first time with full observability, distributed tracing, and customizable visualizations. Datadog is loved and trusted by thousands of enterprises, including Salesforce, PagerDuty, and Zendesk. If you haven't tried Datadog yet at your company or on your side project, head to changelaw.com slash Datadog to find out more. Get a free t-shirt when you integrate. Support our awesome show by checking them out. Our deepest thanks to Datadog for being a sponsor. And now back to the show. All right, we're back with Zeno Rocha talking about this cool history you got, man. I love it. Um, <laughs> and for some reason, people like to start things with you and issues. I, I don't know why that's a thing for you, but that's just how it works out. Maybe that's how it is for most people, and I'm just an idiot. But uh, we mentioned before the break us using Clipboard.js, and uh, apparently this is a pretty popular repository, 16-ish thousand stars. I mean, that's kind of popular, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, back in 2015, October 2015, you got this issue, which was like basically, you know, how did the repo become so popular, right? In, in such a yeah. few days, I, I guess 5,000 mm-hmm. stars in a few days. 
people were essentially attributing it to other things that were were not what was true, like Hacker News or somebody promoting it or whatever. Basically, it was it seemed to be Hacker News. But then you kind of chimed in about five comments into this issue of like trying to investigate why this project was so popular or why had why it had you know gotten so many stars five thousand in just a few days as the issue has mentioned mm-hmm. and you sort of break it down mm-hmm. uh, experience credibility docs and demos timing you sort of put things in perspective for everybody like all this work you put into it that was unseen and, and as we've gone through open source the last couple of years more and more things like this become contributions that are more welcomed obviously because that's what you need but then mm-hmm. also um you know those who are giving those kinds of contributions they're being thanked a lot differently not simply just code contributions but community docs uh knowing your audience these things you're talking through in this issue but mm-hmm. this is sort of a an interesting place you find yourself in which is you know, having to defend yourself in in issues yeah <laughs> Yeah, basically, like uh, Clipboard JS was a very interesting project for me because, um, like, before and for a long time, when I was like, I was building websites for these projects that I was participating, and for every like site of a library or of a framework, you usually have code snippets, right? And right. those code snippets, if you want to make it like good, then you have some syntax highlights on the code snippet. You put like a copy to clipboard button on that. So it make, makes it easier for people to, to just use that code piece. But then uh, like at that time, the only solution was zero clipboard. So that was uh, like what GitHub was using, for example. Uh, it was like this flash. Um, they had like a flash file uh, in the only way of doing that on the web before was by using Flash. I so, remember this hack. It was pretty nasty. Exactly. And exactly. required Flash. Exactly. So as the because, modern web begins to move away from it, obviously you have a feature that may or may not work. Exactly. And I was I never liked the idea of using Flash on my sites, and I was always trying to uh, avoid that. So for many, many years, I had that feeling inside of me, like, oh, this is horrible. I don't want to use Flash on my sites. and when I was like following what was going on on the web platform, I noticed this new API called uh, exec command. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And then I noticed that you could do some copy and cutting. And I started to dig more. I noticed lots of, like, it was not compatible in many browsers, this API yet. But I was like, just going through that. So basically, like, I, I launched the project got super popular and then there was like this beat like this guy asked this question on the github issue and um like everybody was replying like oh it's popular because of hacker news it's of hacker news hacker news hacker news and i was like well wait a second like uh of course you know it's on the, the the first page of hacker news but the only reason why it's there it's because of xyz you know so i was trying to explain what is the the background and why those like it's very easy for someone to see uh like and when when they think about a certain person you know oh i know that person in your case you know me because of clipboard js some other person may know me uh because of something else or or something else i'm going to build in six months you know so it's very easy to you you just see that moment in time and you just uh, make your point about someone based on on that particular thing, and uh, I I really disagree with that kind of uh, thinking because it's like there's a long way in order to make something successful. It's a long way, you know. So I was basically like trying to explain, you know, like uh, this popular it's reason because you know one point is experience because I have been doing open source for a long time. I know what works, what doesn't work. Uh, I have been giving talks, I have been building projects. Uh, so in order to build something that is easy to understand, and, and this is something like building that particular project was not difficult. Uh, it was something that, and you could, you could build one that is much better than Clipboard.js for sure. I, I can totally 
uh, like that, that's not a problem, but how you make that in such a way that it's easy for other people to consume, that's the, the most difficult part. And that's what people don't understand. So they go to GitHub, they create their thing and they hope, okay, now everybody's going to love this. And it's not like this, you know, you need to, uh, I remember spending like one or two days, like a weekend on the library itself. And then I spent like two weeks on the, on the website and not because the website is like complex. <laughs> yeah. It's not I was like expecting web- a much different ratio, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And it's not like the website is complex. Like if you see the website, it's so, re- it's ridiculous, like easy. It, there's no secret at all. Like one page, there's nothing on the website. Uh, but the way the website was built in every particular piece that I was worried about, uh, that was uh, one of the reasons why it was successful, you know. Uh, and also, uh, in order to make something that has a big impact, one thing that, that helped me was also like this credibility that I have been building for many, many years. So uh, I have like a, uh, some following on Twitter, on GitHub. I always try to provide value for other people, always. You know, there's not a single day that I... I don't try to help other people. So when you do that for, for a long period, you start to grow uh, that, you know, that group of people that follow you and, and keep track of what you do, you know? So I think that that was another step and like taking care of your docs and how you communicate, how you communicate your demos. This is super important. Uh, it's very easy to just throw your code out there and expect people to just use it. But if you don't have docs, uh, if you don't explain why you created the project in the first place, I remember spending like a lot of time just on the first paragraph of the site. Uh, I was watching that uh, TED talk about start with why. And then uh, I'm, I'm still really inspired by that. And I try to do everything uh, this way. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start my project with the why. And then how can I communicate in a good way, you know? And then also like the way I timed the project was also very crucial because I knew that only Chrome was supporting that particular feature. Uh, That was it, you know, only Chrome. So I built it and then I waited. So I was waiting until Firefox would release that feature as well. And I knew Firefox was going to release because I was like, tracking comments on blog posts. So I, I noticed like some developers saying that, oh, this is on the, the other Firefox, it's on beta. So, and they, they talked about when they were going to release the, the stable version. So I was tracking that. So when they released Firefox, I think I waited like a few days until people would upgrade. And then I released the project, you know. So that was another uh, important factor. And also, I think like just knowing who you're building things for, uh, it's it's important aspect. Uh, the way I communicate on on Clipboard JS, it's like I know that everybody hates Flash. I know that everybody hates like big frameworks uh, and things that are slow. Uh, I know that everybody loves a simple API that it's easy. You you copy this, you know, it works. So that was what I was trying to do. And that's what I try to do with everything that I do. You know, it's not just put something out there. You can do this, uh, but then you're not truly worried about others. You're just worried about you. You know, you really depends on what you're looking for on a project. Yeah, I can see this now. And I can't say that I see what you've shared just now, just by looking at it. But now that you've shared it, it's almost mm-hmm. like, you know, knowing the secret and then watching the magician again. Yeah. Now you can see, you know, you can see how the trick was played out right yeah. now. I can see your why statement here at the top of the, the page, which I, I, I think that's phenomenal. But you could tell how calculated is the, yes. the thing that kept resonating with me as you were talking through this. The story is like, it seems very calculated, especially when you started to describe the, the patience that you had to not only create it, but then. Uh, be ready when the world was ready to accept it, right? Not just one browser, but now you've got the next other major browser people use or developers use to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, to test their their websites against and stuff. So, I mean, 
that's that's pretty cool, man. I, I mean, yeah. What <laughs> made what is this intuition in you? Did you learn this? I mean, how do you how do you teach somebody some of these kind of like meticulously calculated things that you've done here with this project in particular? Yeah, I think it it comes down to experience. You know, like I have a a guy on my team now, and he like he's starting to learn how to code, and uh, he's like learning all the, those things and uh like there's no way for him uh, even though like now he like three months after now he knows how to code he knows how to build things there's no way for him to understand all this and do that in like in in a little time and and build something that has that impact you know because i know i think that there are all those things that you need to build on top of to get there and it's just a matter of like using lots of things, uh, always keep looking to what other people are doing, what works for others, what don't work for others, you know, and just your experience as a user, that's super important. So I have been using tons of libraries for a long time. I know that you need to start with the install part so they know how they can get and use that. I know that you need to show how you can in, instantiate that thing on their code, you know? And I know that when you approach with an example, how you should approach, what is the best example that that audience is going to get what you're trying to communicate visually, you know? So I know that most of the developers, they use GitHub or they have used GitHub in the past. So when they copy like a repo in order to clone it, they always use the GitHub interface to copy. So I know that that's a very strong example that everybody loves it. So I start with that example and then you keep going, you know. Uh, I know that showing the browser support is important. I know that if there's no browser support for a particular feature, you need to offer something because that's the first thing they're going to ask, you know. Uh, and that's because when I was giving talks about HTML5 in 2011, everybody would say, Oh, but HTML5 is only is only going to be ready in 2020, you know? Right. Uh, and I was like, uh, why are you talking about this? It's not even supported. Or exactly, won't be. exactly. So I I've listened to people uh, asking me those questions for years, and uh, now I learn how to answer those questions. You know, so I think it it comes down to just uh, hard work. Uh, there's no other no other answer so not only have you done something pretty cool with i'm very calculated with this project but then you've also got uh another project about losing weight but not <laughs> on your body yeah uh in the browser in, yeah on your sites and you know i don't know i haven't like i can see dracula coming up in our in our list of topics mm -hmm. to talk about dev space and they're all well designed they're, they're they're well thought through right you can definitely tell they're purposeful and to some out there who aim or aspire to be an open source developer that's daunting because it's like well i've got to do all this work to to mm -hmm. release my open source i just want to share my code i don't i don't want to go through all these things well if you want a project to be successful or to reach the widest audience or in your case if you as you've said help people then you've got to put in the work. And it seems like you've, you've really nailed down how to put in the work, either by you doing the work yourself or uh, finding other people who care about something similar and you know, getting other illustrators or designers to, to sort of take on, so you're not taking the full burden of mm -hmm. building browserdiet.com, for example, how to lose weight in the browser. So talk to me about this. What's the story here? Yeah, so this one, and I think for uh, those projects, uh, it, it's interesting, like we talk about getting a, a project to be popular, right? And what is the reason behind of it? And it's not like, oh, I want to, to be popular on, on GitHub or Twitter, you know, I want to have more followers. Uh, you need to understand what is your why, you know? So uh, that's what motivated me to go one step further. Uh, for browser diet was was exactly like this. Uh, I was I remember when you start with web development, usually the first thing you want to do is okay, I want to get things done with that language, right? So how can I just make something work? So 
when you learn how to make something work, that's good, that's fine, and then you start progressing. And I think the next step is usually you you know how something work. Now, how can I make that thing better? So for me, it was, was like this. Uh, I was learning more about web performance and how I could improve my websites. And uh, I remember there were basically like two guides about that. So one from Google, one from Yahoo. And that's it, you know. Uh, so there was only those two guys and they were like those wide pages, very long pages about something. It was very dense, very hard to read it. Um, it was not easy to consume. And maybe it was easy for like someone else more experienced, but not for me, you know, coming from another country, you know, uh, it was not as in like my age, whatever were the reasons. I think uh, I wanted something that were easy to to digest. So I was like, okay, so I'm just trying to create, uh, I'll just like call some friends, see like friends that I know that care about performance, you know, and uh, and I was like, okay, let's try to to build this guide, you know, like let's divide the work. You do the performance tips for HTML, you do the work for CSS, you do the work for JavaScript. Let's try to break that down but let's try to do this differently. So uh, I invested a lot in how can, make, how can I make this fun? How can I make this attractive for, for just regular people, not like super big experts, you know? So that's how we do it. And we launched it. Uh, it was very fun, you know? And the thing that I'm most proud of was like a few days after, like people started to send translations, you know? Um, I launched in Portuguese and in English and then people like, they saw that there were more than one language and then they were like, Oh, let's send a pull request. So like there were, uh, translations in Spanish and Polish, French, you know, like all these like Chinese, uh, all these languages. And, and it, it was super nice, you know, and the thing that strikes me the most is not the fact, like when I go to Google Analytics, I see like how many people uh, are going to the site. Okay. So I go there and then I go to like, okay, let me check the demographics. So it's not like I, I, I don't feel proud about just looking to the number of people that are seeing and I'm like, oh, I'm so nice because I made this project. Lots of people use it. You know, oh, uh, it's not for my ego. It's more for when I go to demographics and I see that, oh, there's like an access from uh, Madagascar, you know, oh, how come my work? And that's crazy, you know, like if you think oh, yeah. about it, it's like you close your eyes and think about it, how my work reached that place, you know? <laughs> right. There, Somebody in Madagascar right now is listening to the show. Exactly, exactly. That's crazy. Like, yeah, the the only thing about I know about Madagascar is like the the lion and the, it's the Disney movie, right? Right, right. right. <laughs> that's the only thing I know, and uh, that's crazy, you know, and uh, it, it's just insane, and and that's what motivated me. Like, if you do that uh, a step further, if you go a little bit, uh, if you try to do something more polished, uh, and you reach those places, it's like an, it's a crazy feeling just crazy. So to break down this particular page, browser.com, mm -hmm. you know, it's got headings, does performance really matter? So it's essentially like a single page, not a single page app, but it's a single page guide into basically breaking down web performance and how to, you know, get the most out of your, your web pages. And as you said, at that time, there wasn't a lot of information out there. So this was a plan to, you know, get more of this information to the masses. Now, one thing that, that stands out to me in the interface pretty quickly and I'm wondering if it was there always is the edit button that goes, that links back to the, this repo yes. and GitHub back to each thing. So was this, this was there from day one? Not from day one, but it was something that I learned along the way. Uh, and this is something that I try to do uh, on every documentation page that I write nowadays. So this is like, I think when you, when you build something and if that particular content is on GitHub. And I always try to use Markdown. If I'm doing something that is content heavy like this, you know, this is a guide that each tip, if you check the source code, each tip, it's a Markdown file. So what is the easiest way for people to contribute with content? It's Markdown. So 
you need to use Markdown. And then there's like a build process that converts all those into HTML blocks. And then I put all those HTML blocks in the same page. So I really wanted to do in such a way that if you click uh, this edit on GitHub, all you see is like a, a Markdown file, and then you can start editing this Markdown file on GitHub. Uh, and this is something like, as I said, you know, today, I think, and as I learn more and more about documentation, there are a few things that uh, needs to be done in documentation pages that can drastically improve your project. Uh, and all you need is just put a link to it. You know? Yeah. I mean, these things seem to me like uh, invitations, right? E each section. So if I read this and I'm like, oh. I can add mm -hmm. this tidbit to this to to correct it, or yes. uh, even seeing the 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 drop down select menu at the top for be able to choose the different languages. It, it seems very inviting to say this isn't this is a working document. This is not set in stone. This is we may have started this, you know, back to maybe uh, we we didn't start the fire. That's probably a bad example. I won't do that. But that was <laughs> I was gonna make a Billy Joel joke with we didn't start the fire, but it, as I started the unravel it in my head it just didn't make any sense but you know the long story short is like you made this but it doesn't mean that you know you're the only person in charge of moving it yes. forward and if you have opinions or thoughts on how this can change for the better to help the masses mm -hmm. as you're trying to do with the mission of this project then certainly step in and here's your here's your single button for any tip in there to, to do so exactly and when you write documentation it's hard or anything that is content heavy it's hard to know like if people First, if that's right or wrong, you know, so you do your best to do it the right way, but maybe you missed something. Maybe there's a typo or maybe what you wrote is not 100% true for 100% of the cases. So having this option to edit, that's super cool. Another thing I like is uh, feedback. So when you go to, to something and then in this site, there's, we don't have that, but maybe you could have like... Uh, in the past, you know, there was like the thumbs up and thumbs down. And then you, you just like, you kind of vote and just to tell like, oh, what is the feedback for that particular section? And I think nowadays, and as I'm thinking more about this, uh, like the project that I'm working nowadays, for example, we have that, but I see like a trend in terms of reaction. So if you see Slack and someone send it, sends a message and then you have, you can put like a reaction as a emoji. Same for Facebook, same for GitHub. And uh, you see all those big players going on this direction. And, and this is something we could apply to our open source projects because it gives a lot of information uh, and a much more refined uh, feedback for everything that we're doing. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're, we're up against our next break again. So let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk a bit about Dracula, which is super cool. Theming for pretty much any. <laughs> code editor, uh, Vim, you know, S ZSH, you name it, terminal, code editor, it's super cool, I love it. And then uh, some cool stuff you're doing with DevSpace, and then potentially, uh, if you want to share the story around your talk engagement at Erupt, well, we might get into that too, so hopefully we have enough time, but let's break here, when we come back, we'll dive into that stuff. Our friends at ThoughtWorks have an awesome open source continuous delivery server called GoCD. Head to gocd.io slash changelog to learn more. GoCD lets you model complex workflows, promote trusted artifacts, see how your workflow really works, deploy any version, anytime, run and grok your tests, compare builds, take advantage of plugins, and more. Once again, head to gocd.io slash changelog to learn more. And now back to the show. All right, we're back with Zeno Rocha talking about his cool open source. And this thread through all these things is just like careful, meticulous, thoughtfulness, helpful. You know, those are all sort of adjectives I think of when I think about the way you <laughs> approach the project you're involved in. Uh, and the next one on the list for us to talk about is Dracula theme or, or just Dracula for short, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, some may say Dracula theme because that's the theme they're using for their particular code editor, whether it's uh, Adam, Alfred, Emacs, Pigment, Slack. I mean, anywhere you can basically apply a theme, Dracula is there, basically. Mm -hmm. What What yeah. is this project? Why? Why? Yeah, why? Why? <laughs> ah, 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 yeah. ah. So basically this... 
<laughs> the, basically, this one started from like a very crazy story of my life. I was like uh, giving talks a lot, traveling around, and I was giving a talk in Germany. And then I, I ate something, you know, it didn't, uh, I, w I wasn't feeling better, I wasn't feeling good at all. And then I got a flight uh, to give a talk in Spain. And then in the middle of the f flight, I was feeling very bad. I ended up in the hospital for like three weeks. It was crazy. And then at some point, like uh, I was feeling better. I could use my computer uh, at the hospital. And then I was just like just working over there. I was happy a little bit because I had my computer. I could communicate with my family. <laughs> uh, and then at some point when I was in the hospital, like I left my room for like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and then someone stole my, my computer. It was the worst thing in the world. And then, okay, so I had no computer. I had no way to communicate with my family. Crazy story. I know I'm going to get there. And then uh, I had some coworkers in Spain, so they brought me a new computer. And then I was like configuring everything for my new computer. And then I was using iTerm. I was using Sublime. I was using all those things. And then I was like, hmm, so I like now that I have like a fresh computer on my uh, like fresh setup, and I was doing like styling all those those softwares. I noticed like I had lose uh, everything that I lost it, all the my configurations, everything. So I was like, oh, I think I'm going to give a try and start to like build a theme so I can use on all those new softwares that I'm building that, that I'm stalling. So I started Dracula this way. <laughs> and basically, like I like dark themes. Uh, I like uh, building uh I, I'm not like a big fan of light colors on on code editors. So no, nobody is. Yeah, <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that actually. That if you're out there, no. and you like a light theme, uh, come see us after the show. We'll, we'll 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 convince you why you shouldn't. Yeah, that's very controversial. I'm not gonna even get that. <laughs> yeah, Taz versus spaces, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But then that's basically how it started. And it's just like a theme, you know, just a color scheme that you can use on your on your code editor. I started with few the the ones I, I used. And I think nowadays there's like 67 or 65, around 60 uh, softwares that they have themes for Sublime, even paid softwares, which is crazy. Like I saw the other day, uh, there's like a, this new cool app for taking notes. It's called Bear. And it, in order to have themes, you need to pay. And then one of the paid themes is Dracula. Crazy. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Wow. And, uh, but it's MIT, the license, so they can use it. That's fine. Gotcha. <laughs> well, yeah, it's so not they're not paying for Dracula. They're paying for access to themes, and Dracula is one of them. Yeah. Right, exactly. that's probably, yeah. But yeah, yeah. either way, either way. I yeah. mean, <laughs> for one... Uh, in a hospital and somebody steals your computer like how dare somebody ever steal your computer okay not just yours but anybody's like that's to a yeah, hacker they, like <laughs> that's their lifeline you you basically just stole everything that that assuming you may back up something of course yeah. you're using git and github so you're probably got your projects backed up hopefully you yeah. you've, you've pushed all of your latest branches mm -hmm. and whatnot so that's a that's a good reason to uh, always ship your code to 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 somewhere else yeah. basically yeah, I learned two things. One is, uh, so I, I didn't lose my projects or on GitHub. That was fine. But I lost my talks because mm -hmm. I didn't back up. Wow. So that, that, was, that was bad. And the other thing. That's so painful, man. Yeah, so painful. The, the, the most painful part was losing my stickers on ah, the computer. Yes. That is hard, man. That yeah. is hard. <laughs> Especially like, so there's not many people. There, well, I guess I shouldn't say that. There's lots of people who put stickers on their computer, but there's not many. It, basically, if you do, if you do that, right, if you put stickers on your computer, it's like a big thing to those people who do it. I stopped doing it uh, because I'm not mobile enough to need to make my MacBook look different than somebody else's. So that's usually reason number one. And number mm -hmm. two is just because you want to represent yourself, right? It's, it's identity, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but the, those who do it, it's like how dare you <laughs> yeah. one talk about my stickers in a bad way or two take my computer with them on it. You know, don't yeah. do that. 
<laughs> exactly. So no, nowadays I have like a backup of stickers. So if I need to change mine, uh, I know that some people, they buy like covers yes. for their computers. I used to so do that. Buy a cover, yeah. put stickers on the cover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was me. I just didn't want to like, you know, sticker up the actual MacBook. It was just too impressive to do, which <laughs> I have a different feeling about that now, but whatever. Yeah. Anyways, I've turned a new leaf, but this, this is super cool. So you pretty much have a, a theme for everything, but you didn't do all the work to do all this. Did you, you just sort of. No, started no. the process and everybody else just like with translating uh, mm-hmm. browser diet you know you just mm-hmm. started the thing and and people came along and, and agreed with the need that uh, this help you were providing to the community through open mm-hmm. source and and how did that work yeah so nowadays i like if i go i just i just went to the organization page on github i went to theme uh, teams and like there are 44 teams on that organization and there's basically like a theme uh, a team for each theme <laughs> so like the, it's usually like one member two members uh, per theme but i try not to because i don't know the, most of the the softwares i don't use the softwares that people are submitting you know so there's no way for me to and just like uh, i learned that in order to scale an open source project you need to give power to other people there's no other way like you you're just one person so uh so that's what i do nowadays i have the repo and that repo uh i tried we try to follow like a pattern if you go to each repo there's like some consistency in terms of what is the the readme about what is the structure of the readme you know shows who built the the theme a screenshot of the theme you know the like install instructions so there is like a pattern and we try to follow that, but I don't like, there's so many things that uh, it's impossible, you know, and software is changed all the time. So you need to update the, the theme. It's very hard, man. Maintaining things, it's not easy, but uh, yeah, I'm glad people are, are using Dracula. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty crazy, man. I mean, there's, there isn't one thing in here that uh, Sublime, Adam, that people don't use. And I think what's interesting is, um, is just laying down the tracks for others to follow. And, and something that actually was, that was said in one of the most recent episodes of The Change Law by Kent C. Dodd, he said, and tell me if you agree with this, so I'm going to quote this, because he said, and I mm-hmm. quote, give commit access freely and early, the payoff is worth it, end quote. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and so, like, you've got this thing where, like, it's sort of pride, it's sort of ego. These are some things you touched on earlier. You didn't say pride, I did. But you said mm-hmm. ego. And there's often reasons why we, we as humanity have those things. It's because we want to retain and, and command control, mm-hmm. right? And, and if we have to realize in, that open source is not one person, it's not an island, it's mm-hmm. an ecosystem, it's a community of people. Mm-hmm. And the only way to make that possible is by, I guess, being a bit vulnerable and mm-hmm. sharing some of that control. And maybe giving some of that trust early or often to people. And it's tough in a world where maybe you've been, maybe you've been wrong by somebody. Like, like your first step into open source, lead all the <laughs> things, do it over. You know, I mean, it's yeah. pretty easy to be jaded if that's mm-hmm. how you started, but you're not. I, mm-hmm. I don't get it. You're, you're an yeah. anomaly. <laughs> I guess everything about open source is counterintuitive. You know, like we could be spending our times doing freelance work on yeah. our free time. Uh, and instead of making money, we are building something for free. And sometimes we're spending even more time doing this uh, than the other thing. So uh, same as you, what you, this quote is perfect. You know, it's super counterintuitive. Like we as human beings, we want to have control about this thing that we just created. There's mm-hmm. no reason. Like, because I know, like, sometimes they do something wrong and then you see that and you're like, oh, you know, but it, it totally pays off. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Everything about open source is, is crazy. I don't know how it works, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good, though, because it's an exercise in humanity, if you ask me. I think that's what uh, I've learned. I, I came for the code, not stayed for the people, you know. I, mm-hmm. That's how I feel about open source. It was just... Uh, it's weird how we got here and I don't know, I didn't expect this to be the path that ended up being. That's why we're doing such crazy things at, at change logos because we care about people, 
You know, we want to help people like sure. Talking to people like you on shows like this and producing podcasts and uh, Mm -hmm. sending out emails and newsletters and doing live shows and going to conferences and doing some of the film stuff we do like that's all fun. But at the end of it all, the whole point of it all is touching people's lives, inspiring people, uh, hearing people's unique stories and just Mm -hmm. getting in the trenches with people, you know? That's that's what it's yeah. all about for us is is, is that um, back to Dracula, though, Dracula So if you're listening to this, go there, scan. If your editor slash thing you want to theme is not in that list, clearly you can fork this and contribute back or create a, a is the process to fork or is it to create your own repo and then do a get sub module? What's the process? So nowadays, since everything is like spread across repos, usually like you create a new repo, you fork the template, right. which has everything that you need on the readme, and then you start doing your code over there. Nice. Okay. So you got yeah. an easy to find template. Mm-hmm. We'll find that. We'll link that up in the show notes too. So that way we kind of give one more, one less step to those who are following along with this process. It's a crazy story. In the hospital, somebody steals your computer. You find some time. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're you're theming all the things, basically. Yeah, I, I yeah. love it. I love it. Yeah, uh, we're getting close to the end of time. We got about five ish minutes to go. One, mm-hmm. uh, two more things we want to talk about. Well, actually, it was technically one because you mentioned the hospital story. Um, mm-hmm. But maybe that's all you want to mention about it. You tell me. But then you've got mm-hmm. Dev Space. So if anybody out there, I don't know, have you heard of this thing called GitHub? <laughs> You know, notifications, you can track people, you know, like you know, different orgs, you know, lots of stuff is happening on GitHub. And unless you're like eyeballing your email for your notifications, or maybe you're sending those things into a Slack room or something like that, it, it just sort of blends together. You've made it a way with dev space to stay up to date with what's happening on GitHub pretty easily in a, if you've ever used a tweet deck or something like it or Hootsuite even. Very similar. Where you have columns, you've got threads essentially that way. Very easy to follow. What, why did you make this? I think it was a natural uh, step as well. Like Since I was using GitHub so much and I was working with other people, I just wanted to visualize what was going on across all these orgs, all these repos. And that's, that's what I built it. And I've, I liked, at, at the same time, I have been using TweetDeck for a long time. I like the way the columns are structured. I think it's a good layout for keeping up updated with what's going on. So basically replicated that model for, for, for GitHub. Now, one thing that is, is different about this versus the things that we've talked about before is what? It's not open source yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you got the yet in parentheses then? Yes. Because uh, What's the reason why? Since uh, I'm doing so many, like the the way Dev Space started was like I was not thinking. I was only thinking about the product, the end result, uh, and not about the code as much. So, <laughs> but let's put it this way. So I just like I wanted to put something out there. I want, and one of the the excuses I, I used to build Dev Space was also I wanted to try React. So it was my first project with React and all this. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep this as a private repo for now. And then when I find time, I'll, I'll make this open source. So mm. <laughs> that's pretty much it. So this is a web app. It's not an actual native app. So I'm assuming that mm-hmm. you may be going the, down the route of, or at least following the conversations happening around progressive web apps. Yes, that that's exactly another excuse that I use for building this. I wanted to try progressive web apps. And uh, basically the way I built is if you go to your Android phone or your iOS phone, uh, you can like add to your home screen. It has service workers, all that kind of uh, things. And you can have like a app like uh, user experience on your phone. Gotcha. And what's the state of that with iOS for, for those who haven't been tracking PWAs? Yeah, it, it's working fine on, on, on iOS as well. Okay. Last I checked, at least, I wasn't sure that Service Workers was available in Safari. Is that a new thing? How, how new is that? 
Uh, I'm not sure about service workers in particular, but the the manifest file, which has like everything you need, you know, for for make that work. Yeah, it's working. Have you blogged at all about some of your tribulations around this path to to follow the PWA bandwagon, basically, and make dev space? I haven't. And I was like super into PWAs like a few months ago, and I was like, okay, I'm going to build this. This is going to be like a use case, you know, that I can share with everybody. In the end, I didn't have time to, to write a blog post. So since you're, you kind of answered the one question, the next question was going to be until I looked into basically how to install it from uh, Mac or Android. Now I see instructions. So then I thought, well, it's probably down the PWA space versus like say Electron, for example. Mm-hmm. Any, any reason why you went the PWA route versus Electron? Since it's a, a desktop application, did you want it to be a mobile thing too, I guess? Yes. I, all, I also started with, uh, so I have a local version of DevSpace using Electron. And I may like share that in the future. It depends on, like nowadays, Clipboard.js is taking a lot of my <laughs> free time, you know, everything that, uh, like it's almost everything for that. Uh, but if I find some time, uh, I want to share the Electron version. It's working fine on my machine, but in order to share with other people, you need like installers, certificates for, mm-hmm. for Mac. You know, there are all those, those boring parts that you need. And once I, I finish all that, I'll share. So when Faraz Bukadije was on the show a little while back, right towards the end of the show, I'll link this in the show notes, but you go back and listen to that near the end of the show, he has an idea. He didn't, wasn't very clear exactly what it was or how it would work, but basically it would take that last mile that Electron makes, you know, building native apps on multiple platforms pretty easy, except for the packaging part, right? Which is the things you just mm-hmm. described there. So he has an idea for that, that he may do as a, a, a money making idea, I suppose. Because he's all about mm. passive income and whatnot. So you should follow Faraz if you don't already to, to maybe That's check that awesome. out. But so anyways, so let's get back to the yet in, uh, in parentheses. So um, m- maybe this is a syndrome and we've only got a, about a minute and a half to go. But maybe this is a syndrome where someone like you who is so thoughtful, is so caring, is so meticulously planning and whatnot that they feel like they can't open source something because of the potential backlash of the not so good code because they put so much good code out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How and do you feel it's about a, that? I, I, I feel like this is like a real pressure that you get once you start doing more stuff. Uh, I wish this, uh, and I don't think it prevents me from, from doing that. Like I don't, I don't stop writing new projects because of that, but it's, it's like, it's something that, uh, I wish I didn't feel, you know, I, I, I wish I would just put out there and if it's bad, it's bad. Send a pull request. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just, a something that I wish I, I didn't feel. <laughs> the pressure is yeah. real. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. it's a good thing though, right? I mean, it shows that you, it shows that you put the time in, right? Mm-hmm. Just back to that original issue. Like, why in the world does this repo get 5,000 stars in uh, three days or whatever? Well, it's because mm-hmm. I put in the work. You know, you weren't being boastful about it. You were just being truthful and factual. Like, mm-hmm. I, it's, it's popular because I put in the work. And because you put in the work, people have slightly higher, dare I say it, expectations of you because, because of that. Yeah. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad yeah. thing. Yeah, I think... Uh... I, I, my, my mindset nowadays is I rather like spend one year in a project and do something that the quality is high, something that I'm proud of, something that I'll like come to my mom and say, Hey mom, here's a project that I built, you know, let me, let me show you, uh, then doing like 30 projects and doing things that are, are not good or don't work or, so I think this is, um, as a, as a developer, this is something I try to uh, to take with me, like quality first. Quality first. I like that. So we're, we're here at the end. 
one last thing from you is is any closing thoughts, any words of inspiration, anything that we just didn't have a chance to cover that you're like, man, I, I have got to say this before we close out. Do you have anything like that? No, no. I think like uh, my, I, I like the reason why I'm doing this is I just want to like, I hope that this helps someone. Uh, if you're listening, you know, like, uh, like I'm not here to like, oh, here's all the projects that I built. Look how, how awesome I am or just use everything that I, uh, I did, you know, uh, that was not the goal at all. Uh, the only reason why we're here, it's because we wanted to just, uh, like give a different perspective on how you could work or a different take. You know, I think it's, I learned so much from other people and I, if I have the opportunity, I want to share uh, those things that I learned. So I hope this was helpful. And yeah, uh, like I'm, I'm super glad that I'm here. Like I have been listening to the changelog for a lot of time and well, now I'm here. So <laughs> thanks, Adam. No problem, man. It was, it was really fun. I'm glad. And I know we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but we'll link it in the show notes. Cause I did catch this as I was planning for this call was, uh, it's uh, your name.com. So zenarocha.com slash reminder. And it's just a reminder to people what time means. And I have a similar blog post I wrote after someone passed away that I kind of reflected on what time means. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and have this conversation. Then also the time that you spend to, to enrich the lives of developers out there. That's, uh, that's our mission. That's your mission. And it takes time to do so and we only get so much time so i appreciate you taking your time today and you the listener listening to this i appreciate your time as well so thank you for tuning in and uh that's it man thank you so much for joining us it was a pleasure awesome thank you bye-bye everybody all right that wraps up this episode of the change law join the community and slack with us during our shows in real time come hang out at the changelaw.com slash community follow us on twitter we're at changelog Special thanks to our sponsors, Sentry, TopTal, Datadog, and also our friends at GoCD. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. This episode was edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.